Good evening. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Spear, current president of the El Paso County Medical Society for 2022. We at the El Paso County Medical Society are very proud of this program. We are certainly grateful for the collaboration of both Star City Studios and KCOS for making this program a reality. We are also incredibly grateful to Ms. Catherine Berg, who has been such a terrific partner for the last 25 years being this program's host. We hope you continue to join us each and every month for this fantastic program, and please enjoy the presentation tonight. Thank you very much. If we are ever in a serious accident and we need blood, most of us just take it for granted that it's going to be there. That's not necessarily the case. There is the issue of what blood type you are and the hope that someone was kind enough to donate some blood for you before your accident ever occurred. We are here this evening to explain the importance of blood donation and hopefully to convince you to donate some blood because you never know when you're going to find yourself in the need of a stranger's generosity. During the next hour, we have experts that are answering your questions about saving lives through blood donation. It is all because of you. Um, this program is underwritten by Vitalant. Did I say that right? Blood Services. Uh, we also want to say a big thank you to the El Paso County Medical Society for bringing this program to you. It is the El Paso Physician, and I'm Catherine Berg, and you are tuning into the El Paso Physician. So thanks again for joining us. This evening we have a program called Because of You, Life Goes On. Isn't that nice to know? Um, it's your role in blood donation. And so with Vitalant, Vitalant we have uh, several people here, and we also have a trauma surgeon here. But directly to my left, we have James Duggar, um, and you are the manager of Vitalant here currently and locally, correct? The, the division vice president. Oh, you're far more important. <laughs> you are the division vice Somebody's president. Do it. Hello, sir. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And then we also have Bradford Ray, who is with UMC. And then we have Dr. Alan Tyrock, who is uh, with UMC, with also Texas Tech Paula Foster School of Medicine, and he's the chief trauma surgeon. And you've been on here uh, several times before, and you're the guy that tells gross stories. And it's really cool because <laughs> we learn all kinds of stuff. We can all uh, tell. The, we, he and I can tell the gross stories. Oh, that's I'm for sure. sure. And, and often we have pictures, too, but sometimes we need to Maybe let people tonight. know to look away. <laughs> look away. Look away. Um, but, James, I'm going to start with you. I know that you and I have talked a little bit over this last week on different things that we want the general public to know about, about blood donations, about services in general. So I'd love for you to just say to the audience what you do all day, every day. It's kind of like my joke way of explaining what every person on the panel does, because you wear a lot of different hats. And for this program tonight, what are we talking about? And what do you want to get across? Just kind of what your role is here in El Paso. Well, my talent is, is a nonprofit blood center and the, the service that we provide is we're that with the general public's generosity of donation, we're that link between giving and living. We're the, the conduit to get blood from one individual to the places where it can be transfused into another individual. It sounds like it would be fairly simple, but in reality, it's fairly complicated. Mm -hmm. We rely, it's a very personal ask. Um, because it's a very personal type of a process that you have to go through. You kind of have to bury your soul mm -hmm. to people that you don't know, questions to be qualified to become a, a blood donor. And then we will take, and we're the, and we're the only safety uh, net between uh, a donor and a recipient. So we have to ensure 100% uh, safety and top quality because that's the expectation of our hospitals and certainly the patients out there. We try to inspire as much as we can uh, people to give their time and leave us their blood as best mm. that we can. Um, leave us their blood. I like the way you say that. <laughs> and, and, and the competing priority for people's time today seem to be more and more all the time. There's no more than 24 hours in the day. There's just a lot more things that are packed into those days for folks. So, so it is, that is definitely the, the, the challenge. Patients are our purpose. Mm -hmm. Inspiring people to donate blood is our passion. Nice. Wow, you sound like you have a mission statement right there. I love it. <laughs> Bradford, top of that. No, so uh, with your role at UMC, what is your specific role in dealing with blood services at UMC? Yeah, I'm the director for patient blood management. So I cover everything from massive transfusion all the way over to those that perhaps can't get blood because of an antibody or some type of an infection and where blood is just not available for them, or they just refuse transfusion. Mm. So then we're able to assist those patients with other means so that um, 
we can help them. Dr. Tyrock and I have worked very closely on this together over the five and a half years I've been at UMC in incorporating policies and procedures, bringing in new products that Vitalant has made available that have really helped the trauma patient. So a lot of what I was looking into and researching for this evening is, is the products and uh, <clears throat> differentiations of what products are available, what you can do with whole blood, what can be separated. And so that's always been a curiosity of mine. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that this evening. And Dr. Tyrock, you're the guy that just needs blood. Um, I always look at you and by gosh, we've been doing this forever. My daughter's 25. Oh and I gosh. remember when you and I and my daughter who is still in her car seat, uh -huh. we were talking about how to buckle up kids because of car crashes. And I remember you saying to me maybe 23 years ago, Catherine, they're not car accidents, they're car crashes. Right. And it immediately Immediately just put me into a serious mode of, wow, we really need to talk about life and death situations. Mm -hmm. And in the situations that you see, you need and require a lot of blood. We um, definitely do. Talk about that a little bit and what your sure. role is with this. So blood saves lives. I can tell you that. For the trauma patient, most definitely. But we actually use blood for other things like surgical, op surgical procedures, cancer patients, people with le leukemia, lymphomas. But... I'm a trauma surgeon predominantly, and I use a lot of blood. Uh, so do my colleagues. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have a patient that may require 30 to 50 units of blood in one day. Go so back to. So when you say unit, how okay. much is a unit of blood? When it's roughly a pint. Blood. Okay. Roughly a pint. Okay. And about this is me one a little patient. less. One patient. It's going back to August 3rd, 2019. We. At UMC alone, on that Saturday, that terrible day, we had 14 patients come in in 34 minutes. That afternoon, we used 59 units of packed red blood cells. We used 39 units of uh, what we call plasma or FFP, fresh frozen plasma. And we used a large amount of platelets and something also known as cryoprecipitate. So we used a ton of blood that day. And I remember that weekend, including that Saturday, uh, Vitalant and was hosting blood drives and people mm -hmm. were lined up down the, uh, the, the that. block doing that. So we really appreciated that. I can remember <clears> going <throat> back to 9-11. Uh, we had no blood in the region because what happened for about three days after that date, no flights. Oh. We ran out of blood or we were close to running. I should say we ran. Right. We were very right. close. So we as a city had to stop all elective cases mm -hmm. Finally, around September the 14th, they allowed, I think, Border Patrol or Customs to bring us some blood from the Tucson area just so we would have more on supply. So that's just how important blood is to us. Mm -hmm. So we use platelets for clotting, plasma for clotting, red blood cells. We call it packed red blood cells. And we use cryoprecipitate, which is a more condensed version of clotting factors to help us. But what we're doing now, I think, when did we start, Brad, for about two years ago now with the whole blood? Yeah. Thereabouts. Something known as whole blood. And that has made a marked difference. I used it today on somebody. I used it on a young child on Sunday night. And it's really the only resuscitated fluid I used on those patients. Well, on hmm. the child. I used some other stuff on the lady. But in the past, we give a lot of crystalloid, which is salt water, essentially. We use liters and liters. But we learned from the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, mm -hmm. stuff that we actually had learned in the Vietnam war and World War II, but we forget things after wars. And the only good thing from right. war, you learn how to learn your medical stuff again, is to give whole blood. Mm -hmm. So the military actually has a walking blood bank. And so they I'm just, gonna, they I'm donate to the site. Okay. when you say whole blood. Okay. As a layperson, I'm just thinking, well, it's the full-on whole blood that's taken out, nothing separated, nothing's... Di you know, separated, mm -hmm. you know, put into products. That's correct. Is that what you're That's talking really about? That's really what so, it is from a basic standpoint. So when, uh, I again, I was trying to do some research. So years and years ago, it was about the shelf life, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, correct, uh, about whole blood having a certain shelf life, which was less than when you separate blood out. If I'm wrong, tell me. You're pretty right. I'm trying that. to understand why it was that in the old days, whenever the old days were, uh -huh. that everybody used whole blood because it was whole blood. And then somewhere along the way, things started separating. And again, well, we can keep maybe platelets for a longer time. Maybe we can keep, um, you know, whatever the... the plasma the, Yeah, exactly, the way things are packed. So explain, <clears throat> and whoever it is on this table, who does that? And sure, maybe, they probably know just as much as I do, but yeah. the whole blood sort of came out mm -hmm. in the World War II era, okay. in the Korean and Vietnam era. 
But then when they brought it to the civilian sector, it made more sense in a way to separate it to the various components. So you could store the plasma. Well, I think you could actually freeze it for a yeah. while. A year. I mean, yeah. You could freeze it for a yeah. year. Yeah, a year. And okay. some patients did not need the red cells. They just needed the platelets because they had a low platelet count because of their cancer or whatever. So they would just get the platelets. I used to joke, I need the plasma more than I need the red cells because I need you to quit bleeding. That's what the plasma <laughs> right. does. Right. So, but now we come around. What comes old is now new again. So we've been using whole blood. We were the first uh, hospital in El Paso in the region to use whole blood. I think one or two others in the region now using it a little bit, but we're using a ton of whole blood. And it, I can tell you it's a better resuscitative fluid by far, but you can elaborate more on no, that. No, I, I like call. this. And James, if I can bring this to you. So when we're looking at um, asking people to give, because that's, that's the charge. The mission is let's get people to donate. It's going to save lives. When someone comes in, you were talking about, you know, they bear their souls and the questions. <laughs> and what is the explanation that your staff gives to someone who is donating blood? Is it, uh, is, do they go through the questions of, well, do you want my plaza? Do you, do you want my blood? Do, is that even a thing? It just all gets donated and gets separated somewhere else along the way. What is that communication and that narrative between the general public and Vitalant? Well, once we determine that donors well uh, and healthy and, and, and can donate and is eligible to donate blood, then knowing their blood type kind of then leads into another conversation, mm. uh, different, different blood types uh, are, are better for transfusion because uh, they need to be matched to the recipient. Whole blood is no different because there's antigens on that, just like anything. So there's O, A, A, B types. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on, the donor's, depending on the donor's blood type, we will target their donation to what we believe is the most needed. In this case, if we have orders from our, from our hospitals and when they want whole blood, we will target those donors that are best suited to, to offer those whole blood donations. Other donors, hmm. depending on their blood type, we may want plasma from them or we may want platelet products from them. Others, we may want to do packed red blood cells, uh, which is which is transfused more than whole blood. Whole blood's fairly new, and, and uh, most of the bigger facilities, like like University Medical Center, will be will be facilities that will use whole blood more than other hospitals. Okay. It's mainly for the trauma patients that we Correct. use the whole blood. And you were talking about different <clears throat> blood types. So the O positive is the universal donor, and is that also the universal receiver? Because I know you've got the ABs and the maybe talk through the different types of blood types, different types of blood types, um, because their universal donor is what? The universal donor that can go to anybody is, is O neg. O negative. I thought it was positive. Okay. Um, and then the blood type that is the rarest and most difficult to get is an AB negative. Is an AB negative. So my first boyfriend um, <laughs> was an AB negative guy, and he got called every three months to give blood. And he did. He did it like clockwork. But I remember that being such, and that's when I started learning about how all this was. I'm an old positive, so I feel like I'm just, you know, running the mill. Um, on that note, do you have a, for the lack of a better word, a donor list of people that we know that these people usually give and we know that we need this type of blood and you make phone calls? And this is a great time to talk to our audience about, hey, we need some more types A, B, C, and D. The, for, I guess, for clarity, AB negative is, is the rarest blood type. Type O negative is the, and type O blood is the type of blood that we look for the most because it's the one that's transfused the most. Anybody can get it. Anybody, okay. Anybody can. O negative, anybody can receive. That's correct. But, so, okay. but O neg is 4%, 6% of the population, where O pos is 38% of the population. Um, it's the RH factor on there that makes the difference. Um, so we have a, so we keep up with a list. If you are type O, we'll, we'll call you looking at our blood inventories every single day. We will match our calling strategy or our contact strategies to those inventory needs and, and, and those demands. We try to keep in contact with our uh, hospitals to see what their demand looks like and certainly what their hospital shelves are looking like when mm -hmm. it comes to supply. Mm -hmm. And then we will target uh, messaging to those donors to try to get them to come in. Um, and then there's that whole group of folks that haven't come in that we don't know. That's that we exactly try, who that we're we trying to, try to target. To to. Exactly. So say we've got 20 of those guys tuning in right now. What are you saying to them? Can they come anytime? Is there um, the, the blood mobile? I remember that, you know, in high school, you'd mm -hmm. get out of class for two hours if you donate <laughs> blood. That's kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what are some of the, the people that have not given blood before that thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I should, I should do this for the better kind. 
Well, I would say I don't know of something that you can do uh, in an hour's an hour out of your day that can be as impactful to somebody else's life than sitting and, and giving a, a unit of blood. Mm-hmm. Um, as Dr. Tyrone mentioned, there's a lot of things that can't be done without blood. They can't be as effective as a medical in a medical community as they as they are without blood. And there is no substitute for it. Right. If it's not, if it doesn't come from humans. Um, then we don't have it. And so if you're looking to get engaged, if you want to do something that's extremely impactful, it doesn't really cost you any money. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it'll, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time to come in. And we always like to say, if you, if you come see us, you can get a, a prick, a poke, a cookie, and a Coke. Gonna, Very nice. We're going to prick you in the finger to test how much to test your hemoglobin. Um, then we're going to poke in the arm to draw the blood. <laughs> we're going to give you a cookie and coke on the way out and ask you to come back and see us in eight weeks. And it's a free way to see if your blood's okay. That's right. You know, why not? That's I kind of right. like that. <laughs> Bradford, let's uh, move things over to UMC for a little while. Um, and as the director there of everything that that deals with blood and blood management, um, you've got you've got several different areas within UMC that the blood goes to. And can people give blood there at UMC as well, or is that not you... specifically? Okay, we, we have to have somebody like Vitalin come in. Okay, and then they set up a location for those individuals, the employees, to go to to donate blood. Okay. But we don't have a in-house blood bank at this time. Okay. So when you work with the medical staff, so when you work with Dr. Tyrock and uh, and his colleagues, what is the planning and the strategy stages that you go through with Dr. Tyrock and so that you can come back to James and how how do you do your your everyday planning? It can be quite complicated. And it's convoluted, but at the same time, a, a lot of this has to be done beforehand. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm saying to Dr. Tyrock in the middle of a trauma, he's not, he doesn't want to talk to me. Right. He's, he's interested in trying to save that patient's life. So we have these special meetings where we talk about the latest in research that's coming up from other university hospitals, things that we are doing at the university ourselves to come up with battle plans, you might say, to reduce blood. One of those is a drug called tranexamic acid. And I remember when um, yesterday, three years ago, I got a text from Dr. Tyrock, get to the hospital and manage the blood supply if you're available. Mm -hmm. So I ran to the hospital and was in scrubs and we saw all these people coming Mm -hmm. in and we, I was in the operating room and I went room to 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 room and made sure that some of these additives were being given to the patients because tranexamic acid slows down the need for blood Hmm. and it allows the body to hold the clot without your body trying to break it down okay so it's a very important drug and they line item these according to different societies as level 1a level 1b level 1c tranexamic acid is the highest at level 1A. I see. So okay. we have a policy that we use where I have badge cards that I hand out to uh, the attendings and to the residents that are in surgery that indicate to them what should you do in the event of a massive bleed. And one of those is if they've been given a gram of tranexamic acid in the field, which we are doing now on the ambulances, hmm. um, that's been an ongoing process but it's working, then we'll give them another gram of tranexamic acid in the hospital. If they arrive at the hospital without having had anything, we just changed our policy where we're giving two grams right Hmm. up front. And that way we don't have to worry about pharmacy sending something up later. And that helps reduce the need because we don't have a lot of blood right now. We got to be very honest about this. So because of that, we're doing everything in our power to reduce the need to just empty the blood bank on mm-hmm. one patient. That's mm-hmm. not fair to everybody else. So that's that one, has happened. Yeah, yeah, that has happened. I remember one of the times I was here, we gave a patient 320 units of blood. It's like, when do you stop though? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. 320. Young person. Mm-hmm. That guy didn't survive. Then we had another young person come in that was inebriated. A car rolled over. He was extricated. The car rolled over on him and injured himself. He got 220 units of blood, and he survived. He survived. 
which was unique. Mm-hmm. But we we did all of these preemptive things to mm-hmm. try to help him. Mm-hmm. Another thing we'll do is we'll use the cell saver, where we'll try to collect the blood that the patient is losing, clean it, and turn around and give back to him his the own. current patient, yeah. so his own blood. Yeah, his, his own, own blood. blood, right. Interesting, and okay. And that way we're able to save his blood along with any donated blood he's been given without relying on, again, draining the blood bank, right. trying to just let it wash down the drain. That's not fair to anybody. Of course. So we, we try to do that. And that's worked out extremely well. Another thing to help clotting, Dr. Tyrock mentioned cryoprecipitate, a new product that we're involved with quite heavily, and they've asked us to do some additional research, is a fibrinogen concentrate. Say that slowly. Fibrinogen concentrate. Okay. And what that does is that replaces a lot of the fibrinogen in the body that acts as the main aspect for clotting. So platelets are number one. Mm -hmm. Fibrinogen attaches to the platelets. The red cells come behind that and you have a plug. Okay. And that becomes very important. But if you don't have a, a rich concentration of these hooks and ladders, because a platelet, for lack of a better expression, runs around in your body like a closed fist. And then when it's needed, it opens and gets sticky. Mm, mm-hmm. So the fibrinogen, when it comes, it attaches to this and it gets sticky. The red cells come and attach that and you have a plug. I see. And the blood, the blood is Is diminished. that the same idea? I'm just trying to picture it in my head. Is a blood clotting type of a drug? Yeah. Yes. So that's blood the same yes. idea. Yes. Okay. It, it greatly In a helps. good way, it's a blood okay. clot. Yeah. yeah. So if we're looking for like a hemorrhagic stroke type situation, <clears throat> I know that's not trauma, but the idea is you want to give something that doesn't allow the blood to get thinner or if you're about to go right. into surgeries. Right. Et cetera. And we're the okay. only, mentioning that, there's, there's drugs that are called factor 10A inhibitors. And they're... I don't want to use the word the enemy mm-hmm. of what we do, but they're necessary to help people from clotting if they have stents or, or other scenarios in their body from strokes, perhaps. But when you reduce the 10A in the body, you will continue to eliminate or reduce the effectiveness of the platelets in the body. We're the only center in El Paso of all the hospitals that are here. We're the only hospital that has this andexanate alpha, which reverses these factor 10A inhibitors in less than two minutes. Jeez. And it's an expensive drug. It's not given all the time, but when it's needed, we need it right now. Mm -hmm. And it works very well. So what we see is trauma. Everybody thinks trauma is some young guy getting shot or stabbed. It's really not. 90% of our patients are blunt trauma, which means car wrecks, falls, motorcycles, and quite often it's old people mm. riding motorcycles, falling from the roof, fixing their water cooler, whatever. And all these people are on these blood, what we call blood right. thinners, right. Plavix, exactly. aspirin, Coumadin. Now the thing he's mentioning, these newer agents like Eliquis, I can't think of the other one. Redexa. Redexa, mm-hmm. which are so great rolling. for your heart and your brain if you had a stroke. But if you get injured, they will bleed like crazy. So our job is to quickly reverse it with mm-hmm. the blood products. That's why I like the whole blood because it's got all the clotting in the platelets. Mm-hmm. We use the TXA or tranexamic acid, which actually is a very old drug. And hmm. now it's come back into vogue and it's very cheap. It's like $25. Mm-hmm. So we use that on our trauma patients. And it, we even some ladies that are bleeding from uh, having uh, deliveries, mm-hmm. they can bleed, so we give it. To, they give it to them too. So we use that, but we use these, this expensive agent he's talking about and some other reversing agents. So we're a lot more sophisticated than in the past. Yeah, the past, just give them more FFP, give them more plasma, give them more platelets. So now we are more sophisticated. There's actually a device which is an old device from the 1940s that just fell out of favor. In the 1990s, it started coming back, and now the American College of Surgeons require every level one and level two trauma center to have that. It's called a ROTEM, R-O-T-E-M, or a TEG, T-E-G. It's just two different types. They basically do the same thing. So we put an aliquot of blood from the patient in there, and in about 10 minutes, we have an answer like, do I need to give more platelets? Do I need to give more oh, interesting. plasma? Huh. Uh, do I need more whole blood? Or do I give the TXA, additional dose of TXA? Or is this patient clotting okay? Or they're lysing their red cells? 
and they're not clotting. Because sometimes a trauma patient will be hypercoagulable, I mean, they clot a lot too much, mm-hmm. or they just don't clot at all. So right. that's the test that we use, and we get the answers like in 10 or 15 minutes after we do that. So I, I'm looking at you, and I'm thinking, again, the last, you know, 23, 4, 5 years that we've been doing mm-hmm. this together. And when we're talking about whole blood and we're talking about these different blood products— just in what you've seen, just by knowing me, I know mm-hmm. there's been times that you practiced before that, but the research that's gone into this, so you're talking about different machines, for the lack of a better word. Drugs and machines. Drugs and machines that, that you are now able to use in the emergency room or, or when mm-hmm. you're doing surgery. Point of care, essentially, is what we call it. Point of care. For so how, how much has that changed? Radic- I, and you can, and you can Radic- even go like, what was it like five years ago? What was it like 10, 20 years ago? This yeah. is the part that fascinates me. Just again, going through how I was going to carry through tonight's program, because I was I was really focused on all these different products. Mm-hmm. But then we're looking at these drugs now and going back to whole blood. So I feel like everything I studied today goes down the toilet. Mm-hmm. Um, but over the last, let's say 20 years, there is a lot more blood products being used, as I understand. Yes. And then now going back to whole blood. And that's that's globally as well as mm-hmm. just here. Why is that? And how did that come to be? Quick, Was it just easy a different? Answer. Okay. So the fact that you used the word 20 years is very accurate. There are about 20 years. Once we went to Afghanistan, once we went uh, to Iraq, yes, you said that the military okay. started losing these soldiers because a third of them were dying because they were bleeding to death so quickly. And they looked at that and said, you know, these are preventable deaths. Mm. So that's when they started using the whole blood. They Actually, they didn't start using whole blood at first. They were using something called a, uh, a balanced transfusion support. Every unit of red cells, they give a unit of plasma. I was going to say, what and, do you use in the field? It's not like you have well, storage facilities everywhere. Well, they, they could bring them. They were so quick with the helicopters and stuff. They wow. could bring them. Okay. Uh, and so they would give a one-to-one ratio. We used to say, give a two-to-one ratio if you're happy, if you're lucky. That's your goal. One to one's your your gold standard. Once again, August third, despite all the yeah. chaos, we were one to one point five, so we were under two that day with all those patients. Mm. But so our goal now had well now has been if you're going to just give packed red blood cells and plasma, you do a one to one ratio. So we monitor that as we're transfusing in the operating room or in the trauma bay or the critical care unit. But since then, what's evolved? Not everywhere, but we have it here at UMC, is the whole blood. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that's more refinement. But then again, we have the agents, the TXA, the Indexanet, other things that we can use. The fibrinogen concentrate, which we just started using. They've been using that in Europe for about five to ten years now. Mm-hmm. And now it's come to the United States. So we're using that. Every place is the FFP or plasma. One extent. thing that to amplify what Dr. Tyrock has said, and I agree with everything he said, is that the military, because we're a military town, mm-hmm. a lot of the new devices that I have brought in, the new hemostatic agents, the rapid infuser, mm-hmm. which is a, called Belmont. Belmont is uh, a military device that can infuse blood or fluid very quickly. And in fact, when a battlefield is going on, I remember at Grand Rounds that one oh, the speaker. nurse, yeah, was talking about it where they would take these Belmonts and they're they're wrapped in a specific, they'll throw them out of a helicopter at 1,500 feet. Dear Lord. They'll hit the ground, bounce, the medics will pick them up, plug them in, and they work. <laughs> so, Jeez. so with yeah. the Belmont, you can give like a unit of blood in what, two minutes or less? Yeah, less than Oh, that. wow. It so depends on the IV you have system. in the arm of the patient. Okay. You can just slam it in there. And it wow. warms it up, too, because yeah. you want warm blood in the patient. Right. So there, that the Belmont has been very effective in being able to do that. We now have six of those that we have purchased. Um, we're looking at some of the hemostatic agents. The military was using a device called Quick Clot. Mm-hmm. I used this years ago, and they used to, when you would pour it on, it was a powder. And when you poured it on, it would hiss and s- mm-hmm. suck all the water out of the blood, but it would get very hot. Mm. On the patient. I remember mm. telling the nurses, don't touch it, don't touch it. And one nurse went over and put her hand, what? You know, because it was hot. Right. Well, when all these military surgeons started leaving Afghanistan and Iraq, they said, we want this in private practice. Well, the FDA said, not at that temperature. Uh huh. So they reformulated it, and it came out as this, towel-type device called Quick Clot. 
Dr. Tyrock and I were talking today about a new product that's coming out that the military uh, is switching to, and we're going to switch to it too. Mm -hmm. And it stops bleeding three times faster than quick clot. And it will work no matter what drug the patient has on board. Is it something that you apply topically as yes, well? Yes. It's okay. A, it's an agent you just lay on the wound. Interesting. Sort of makes a matrix over the wound. Huh. Help stop the so bleeding. almost like so a net type making, of thing. Yeah. Yes. It makes a okay. clotting. Yeah. I yeah. used three of them today on a patient. <laughs> Not the new one yet, yeah. but the older one. So these are just things that, because we have to find a way, because of the diminished blood supply, to find a way to do more with less. Right. And the other thing we haven't touched upon was, so when I trained, mm -hmm. we'd always check the hemoglobin. And if a hemoglobin is less than 10, especially an older person, oh, we got to give them some blood. If the hemoglobin oh. is 8 or 9, oh, give them two units of blood. If you know, give I one, always give two. talking about that, actually. So now yeah. we go down to hemoglobins of 7 to 6, and it depends on the patient's physiologic status. Are the blood pressure okay? Are they making good urine? Are they mentating? We may not transfuse, hmm. especially the younger ones. So we we have a, a lower threshold or I guess a higher threshold to not give the blood. So that's saving the blood for people that really need it. So that's one thing we do. So you hit on a word that is always interesting me to, you know, the transfusion. You know, that mm -hmm. always seems like if you're looking at Marcus Well BMD from 10,000 years ago, it's like, <laughs> oh, he needs a blood transfusion. All of a sudden it's like, what does that mean? But it means several different things. There are uh, full-on transfusions and maybe not though. I would love for someone to kind of explain when somebody says a blood transfusion, how many different things can that mean? And I'm just throwing well, that out to anybody. You do a better job than I can. James, do you get this one? <laughs> well, I mean, anytime blood is going to be used, whether it be a single component or multiple components, to me, that's a single event of transfusion. There may be multiple components in a transfusion okay. episode. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's the same. See, in my little itsy bitsy head, message. I'm thinking, since there's no blood, somebody needs to just get the whole, all the blood goes away, and then so, all so you just depends. get new blood. It depends on the patient. So okay. if I got somebody actively bleeding, I'll give. Like I said earlier, one-to-one -one ratio. Every unit of red cells, I give a unit of FFP. And I usually give the FFP first. I want right. the the endothelium of the blood vessels to start clotting with the plasma, and then I'm starting the blood to go in, and I'm probably throwing in some platelets along the way. But if I have whole blood, I'm going to say, give me whole blood. Uh-huh. Yes, right. On that patient, if we have whole blood. Sometimes we run out. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that. Um, if it's a head injury patient and they're on aspirin, and I see that they're not clotting, I'm going to give those patients platelets because aspirin knocks out the platelets. Oh, right. If they're on Coumadin sense. or Warfarin, right. I will probably give plasma because okay. that's that's how the Coumadin works. It works on the vitamin K-dependent factors of a clotting cascade. So, But we're checking those things with that device I call the Rotem. Before the Rotem, we were using INRs, PT, PTTs, things like that, platelet mm -hmm. function assays. But that's just sort of gone out of the on the wayside now. Those so, worked, but these just work much faster. Yeah. yeah. And rotational, the ROTEM stands for rotational thromboelastometry. As Dr. Tyrock was indicating, it gives you an indicator by means of how these bullets come out. If it looks like a 45 caliber bullet, okay. you don't need anything. If it looks like a 223, which is a rifle bullet, then you begin to decipher, okay, what is it that we need? What specific could this be replaced with? And that's very helpful. If it comes up and looks like a polywog, it comes up and then it just comes down like this. That's called lysing. Mm. And lysing is destruction. So with that, then we'll give tranexamic acid, reverse that, and then see if the patient needs any blood products so, or some other assay to be able to help them. Another thing that UMC's got we're, we're very good at is we love clinical studies, and I do oh, a lot of these. Oh, thank God. Clinical I do a lot of these. And we're, right. we're using a, a brand new device. We just finished it. Mm -hmm. In fact, Dr. Tyrock and I used it very quick, very a lot. Two o'clock in the morning, I was in the hospital running these things with traumas for about, we did two of them. So about, about a year oh, wow. we were doing this. And um, <clears throat> I aged about three years in that year. But... <laughs> Doing that, it enables us to get results instead of 10 to 15 minutes, you get a result in eight minutes. Wow. Okay. And anyone that's in surgery will tell you 20 that minutes is, is forever. Right. right. 
eight minutes, you've got the patient draped and you have a result. So we want to switch to that. Right. That'll be, that's not a military device, but it's a device that the military is incorporating because it's so fast. It's just a new generation. Of yeah. The yeah, it's a new, the latest mouse trap. So when you're talking about clinical trials and, and you're looking at also at any equipment, you know, lack of a better word, machines, equipment, how, do, how did these all come about in the first place? And I know we were talking about the wars and, mm -hmm. and, and getting everything done. Um, and we haven't, and let's just say El Paso. When you have a clinical trial, what makes you think, this is what I want to do? Like, Dr. Tyrock, this would be a question for you, really. What would your wish be when it comes to blood transfusions, being able to get, give people bloods that you see can happen in the next 20 years? So we were talking about 20 years ago. Okay. What you see that is actually realistic can be realistic in your next 5 to 10 to 20 years of everything that Bradford's doing, everything that clinical triers are doing, everything that Vitalant's doing. What is a trauma surgeon would be like, oh, this would be awesome. So when I was a resident, I think like an intern, the big thing that we thought was over the horizon was artificial blood. Yes, right. That really never came into being. And there's always talk, okay, we make artificial platelets. Well, there's been some work on that, but it hasn't happened. What we're seeing, it's going to be a while, I think. There's two things. One is, this one's probably a little bit more realistic. Somebody's got internal bleeding. Well, if you got external bleeding, I can put just direct pressure or we can put a tourniquet on you and get you to the operating room. Now they're looking, I think they're doing this in Baltimore, in Maryland, at the Shock Trauma Center. You know, it's, it's Philadelphia, where they actually inject something into your belly and it's some kind of foam and it'll just make a cast in your belly and it'll essentially make a tamponade effect on the bleeding side. So then you take so the, the blood patient. Can't get it's you just you know it's just holding pressure. See, I can't hold a pressure on your uh, shattered right. liver right. without going in and doing it. So now they just inject it and they'll make a cast all in the abdomen. Oh wow! And you get them to the OR, and then you in control conditions with all the blood available, and then you can take it off and start doing that. Now we're a lot, we're probably about ten years away from that. Right. The other thing, which I think we're much further off, even though it's really pretty cool stuff, suspended anim animation. Which Where is? you just basically <laughs> just stop the patient, chill them, even at the scene, put, basically put them in a coma. So that they and stop bleeding. They so stop readily. bleeding. Interesting. Yeah. Drop their okay. temperature. And you drop their temperature. And That's sci-fi stuff. Heart rate. Yeah. This the is military this is totally Star cool. Trek stuff. The military yeah, is looking is. at that. I think we're about probably 20 years plus away from that one. But they are doing that in some places. Yeah. In some very small clinical trials. Animals first. I think they've even done it a little bit on humans. I could see that being beneficial in so many different yes. areas. Yeah. I mean, again, time, I always think of strokes and heart attacks. Mm -hmm. You're looking at get to the hospital, get everything you need to have done Or fast. if I need to have a major liver transplant, you know, right. it's a lot of bleeding. You may put them in suspended animation and then And it gives the a surgeon liver, extra time. Liver. It gives everybody. It gives everybody time to do what they need to do because it's protecting the brain, protecting the heart right. in the interim. So that's what we're seeing. For brain. me, Common stuff is we need more and more whole blood. Yeah. We're trying to get that in the pre-hospital setting where the ambulances would have it. I know one of the flight companies, they actually come with whole blood. Almost all the helicopter companies now cover, they carry red blood cells mm -hmm. and FFP. So they do that. And they have the TXA, tranexamic acid. So they're already injecting that. It's been shown the faster you give it, mm -hmm. the better it works. Mm. Now it's been shown that if you wait too long, over three hours, you shouldn't give it because it can cause clotting and bad outcomes. So you got to always watch that. But right now we need the blood. And Vitalin's been an incredible resource And in what he hasn't said, but if you give blood in El Paso, right. Vitalin's going to keep the blood here. Not Yay. all blood places do. They all ship it out. Right. They keep it in the region. So, so James, so I've got help, a couple helping of questions El Paso for you. Ones. Yes. So I would love to talk about, so let's go back to whole blood. That, that's still, again, old and new. It fascinates me. The shelf life of whole blood now. I know that you were talking about freezing platelets for about a year. For you can't freeze the platelets. Plasma. 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 Sorry. Plasma. Platelets have to be at room temperature. Platelets are only five days. Okay. And see, that that seems like nothing, yeah, which is why, again, right. plead to our audience, plead to everybody tuning in. Um, that we need platelets hour, a lot. Yeah. A lot of times we, we have zero or basically one or two in that city. Okay. And, and if people that's only, need that. Yeah. Not just for trauma. Mm-hmm. And also, James, if you can walk through, so people who have never given blood, walk through what it is that they 
they can expect coming through the door. So this is a big plea, and I, I'm, I'm for it completely. Number one, the big question was, what is the shelf life of whole blood? Is it the same as platelets? Is it, is it, do you put it in the refrigerator and it hangs out for a while? Does it have an expiration date, like a, you know, bottle of milk? I don't know. <laughs> whole blood, whole blood's good for 21 days. Okay. You know, we don't, because we don't put any type of a preservative on it after processing. Okay. Other components, so if we take a unit of whole blood and we further process that down and separate the red cells off of the plasma, we add a preservative to those red cells. And depending on what you add, it could add, uh, take the shelf life to 35 days or up to 40 two days. Okay. Rare blood will be treated. If it's ultra rare, um, we, we can treat that blood and we can and then we can freeze it. And what does it ultra rare mean? What does that mean? Um, RH Knolls, for instance, okay. is the rarest blood type there is in the world. There's there's very, maybe I 100 gotcha. people or a couple hundred people now. in the world that have that blood type. Okay. So if you find those folks, then um, then they'll freeze those units and they go into a rare donor repository to where it's stored and, and most most facilities around the world will reach into those repositories and pull those units if they need them. Okay. And, we gotta, and there's not very many of them. Right. Um, but what a donor can expect when they come in the door, one, you're going to be greeted with a with a, with a a smile. Mm -hmm. And um, a Coke and a cookie? And, you know, or a soda and a cookie. That's right. Sorry. And, and then we're going to take you in and we're going to put you through a, a, a bit of a screening to make sure that your travel didn't put you at risk for malaria or other things. Um, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about your uh, your health history, um, and then we're going to do a little mini physical. We're going to stick your finger with uh, uh, with a little the little prick that we were talking about, mm -hmm. and to make sure you got enough uh, blood to be able to make a blood donation, take a blood pressure, and make sure that you're otherwise healthy. If you pass all of that, then we're going to take you out, put you in a nice, comfy bed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we've got an outstanding staff that's going to create start that. Uh, really nice experience because it has to be good because you want them you, to come you, back. You are gonna, we are gonna get to stick a rather large needle into your arm. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the reality. It's it's, it's hard. Right. It's no, hard I to, actually, I'd is, rather be realistic. It is definitely right. hard to ignore that. That right. is part of the process. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then everything will go well. And then when you get done, we're going to tell you how much we appreciate that donation and the fact that you're saving somebody's life. Uh, with that generosity, and then we're going to really into the canteen, feed you as many snacks as we can put inside you, and then right. we're going to ask you to see if you're if you loved it enough to want to come back and do it again. Nice. So when you said earlier, you said if there's enough blood in you, and I guess I'm thinking, okay, dehydration is that is that what you're looking at too? Is it like if someone knows I'm going to go to the blood bank, sorry, blood services to Vitalant on Thursday, and it's Monday. So I'm just going to drink a ton of water. Is there something that if someone knows they're going to go, that they should do to help the blood be better, if, that is, if that's even a thing? Well, being hydrated is, is always helpful. Right. Just, you know, increasing your, the volume that you have. Salty snacks are always good um, to, to help. Um, and then eating a good meal will help you tolerate the, um, the loss of blood while you're, while you're bleeding. Um, there's and there's diets, um, things that are high in iron always are helpful to make sure that you're not iron deficient when mm -hmm. you come in because again you're losing blood, uh, whether you're stuck with needle in a, in a controlled bleed or you cut yourself, you're losing <coughs> blood either way. Right. Uh, we do want you to stop during the, during the process. Right, exactly. Uh, at some point, <laughs> all bleeding stops <laughs> one way or the other. That's right. Um, well, you, you just brought up another question in my head too. Uh, when you give blood, usually how long does it take the body to uh, replace what you get? Donating a pint is usually um, what's normal, correct? You, you can't you can't come back and donate again if you if you donate a pint of blood for fifty six days, and that that'll allow okay. your body to replenish what was lost. There's other things, ferritin and iron, and those kind of things that are have other dependencies on how fast they rebound. Diet is, is some of that as well. Um, if you donate plasma, you're going to replace your plasma in 48 hours. Oh, goodness. It, it, okay. It recovers a lot faster. Oh, you said we always need platelets. And platelets. Yeah, yeah platelets are. And, and platelet, platelets are as well because it's a, it's a yellow component. It's, it's, it's platelets that are suspended in a lot of plasma, basically. Literally and because spleen does that. Okay. And because we target those donations, we actually have, uh, in today's technology, we can put you onto a machine that will pull whole blood from you, spin it in the machine, and do it and separate it. Uh, plasma from from red cells and give you back the red cells if we're looking for platelets or plasma, or we'll take the the plasma and, and or, or give you back the plasma. We'll keep the red cells. Mm -hmm. That's what's nice about today's technology. We can target uh, collections that better suits the needs of patients. Okay, and before and you said too when you're looking at the blood type that's coming in, uh, the willingness of the patient, etc. That's when you decide what what process it's going to be. Whether it's going to be whole blood, whether you're going to do platelets, whether you're going to do plasma, etc. All that's decided 
when someone comes in? That is correct. Or, we'll okay. ask, and then if they if their blood type is uh, desirable for a platelet collection, for instance, and they've got some extra time, then we'll we'll put them on uh, on a on machine to collect platelets. That's a that's a little bit longer of a time commitment. Platelets can take anywhere from an hour and a half. But Dr. Tyrock needs them. Yeah, that's that's he right. He really needs those and, platelets. And, and I think that I think that's what's kind of important to remember. When you have donors that, and we have some donors that donate the maximum time, a uh, number of times per year, 24 times per year in platelet donation. That's a lot. Mm. And if you have uh, uh, donors like myself, I'm a platelet donor. It's a two and a half to three hour procedure for me to do that. So in a year's time, I may spend 40 or 50 hours uh, connected to a machine um, Think given, how many movies you can watch on your phone. That's now. exactly. I right. mean, there's so many things you can do now where you're just sitting there. It's fabulous. But you what, know? I, what makes it all work for me is that is some. That's a quite a. That's a long time if you yeah. if you just kind of think about it. But when you on the back end of that, if you transfuse it to the young person, the, the young mother that goes on to have a family, you're preserving generations of life. And for me, it kind of the time just kind of didn't doesn't really matter on how much time I spend. Look at you. You should have this guy following you all day, every day, talking <laughs> yeah, to people. Say, hey, positive. give some away. He's very positive. And it, and it makes you want to nice. give. You know, it absolutely yeah. makes you want to give. Um, we're, we're kind of at that, that 10, 12 minute mark before the, the show starts to wrap up. So what I want to do is really concentrate on, and I know you've got a lot in your hip pocket, so keep that in there. But Bradford, I would love for you to talk about what you wanted to say before you got here today, just the things that you wanted to make sure that we got across. I just want to make sure that the purpose of you coming here today is that we we want to give people to give blood, uh, whole blood if possible, because that's what you need. And the shelf life is longer than I expected. I didn't think it was, what did you say, 21, 28 days? 21, yeah. 21 well, days. Per here. Okay. Well, we're okay. using yeah, the, that's, that's a great point, and I appreciate it. When we were at the height of the pandemic, and everything was, well, we shut the country down mm -hmm. for several weeks. When those things happened, we had to come up with other means to be able to help ourselves. So one of the things that I did was I initiated a drop from seven as a standard number for um, a, a hemoglobin number to consider transfusing. I dropped it to six. Our length of stay has gone way up. It hadn't. Hmm. Everything was the, the same. So with that, we knew we were on to something. And because blood at that time wasn't available, we initiated, I wrote a anemia power plan. And we use that all the time now. Mm -hmm. And in Every conjunction, day, if a patient gets blood, fine. We'll get it to the point that they stop bleeding, and then we'll initiate the power plan. Many times they don't need a transfusion, but they're still anemic. We will initiate the power plan, and that builds their own blood up internally, naturally. So for people who don't naturally understand the terminology, when you're talking about hemoglobin, and you're talking about, I know earlier you said from 10 to 9 to 9 to 8, so we were at 7, now you're going to 6. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by the hemoglobin count being dropping, and you think, oh, we should do transfusion or not? What's happening physiologically in your body when the hemoglobin count goes yeah, down? that's a great question. And generally, it's not just one product that's leaving the body on, on average, unless you have some type of destruction that's occurring that's more of a hematology, oncology concern. Mm -hmm. But generally, when your hemoglobin begins to go down, your plasma goes down. Your platelets might begin to reduce a little bit too. And that becomes a concern because now the, the body is taking on an overall aspect of anemia. Mm. So what we want to do if the patient is healthy and they have lost a lot of blood, there's things that we can do to initiate your body to kick itself into high gear. And sometimes when we don't have blood or we don't have the right type or we don't have enough, we can do this. And we use this again, as is mentioned, every day. Mm -hmm. And when we dropped it from seven to six, I wrote my number down. We saved 1,057 units of blood. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> and that worked out to everybody's benefit. Now that we're using the power plan, I had the, um, we had a conference call today with Vitalant, and we're down in the first quarter 10% on our red cell utilization. All of these things are good because we're still not back to normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 
the thing that we have to appreciate too, and not that I want to berate anything that's being said here, but anytime you take something from Jim and give it to John, right, that's a transplant. Right. And so blood is the only organ, because it's a liquid organ, mm-hmm. that can be transfused by a nurse or initiated by a nurse. So, And why is that? Because of the acceptance of yeah. the body receiving the blood? No, it's because of the acceptance of the, the protocol. And okay. where blood is so part of the culture. And like I was saying, you wanted to initiate it. I'll just do this very briefly. At the end of World War II, the American Red mm-hmm. Cross mm-hmm. was the major donor. Um, and everyone donated to the American Red Cross. Um, when World War II ended, the American Red Cross went around to several blood banks around the country that were independent and said, join us, shut down and join us. And they said, no, Mm -hmm. we're not going to do that. They then united themselves and formed AABB, which was the American Association of Blood Banks. Now it's the American Association of Blood and Biologics. Mm -hmm. So another point that Dr. Tyrock mentioned, which I find is fascinating myself, because one of the reasons that got me into this was the blood substitute research. Mm -hmm. And we've used blood substitutes at UMC seven times. Now, see, to me, when I hear blood substitutes, I'm thinking artificial blood. This is a complete different different thing. Okay. So explain the difference. Yeah. When you think of artificial blood, you're thinking of that there's multiple individuals in the industry. They're looking for the magic bullet. Mm -hmm. Some of them are actually made by pleurofluorocarbons. What in the heck is that? It's Okay. This might take too long to explain, but in, <laughs> in, in World War II, when we built the atomic bomb, they had to find a way to keep it cool. Okay. They put water in there, and the core was so hot that the water just literally busted apart. It didn't even come out of steam. So they said, we got to find other products. What they did was they found if they put silicone into this, the silicone would melt. That would keep the core cool. But because of the heat of the, of the core of the atomic bomb, it totally changed the chemical makeup of the silicone. It wouldn't get hard. And a doctor from the University of Alabama uh, at Birmingham was sitting in his office one day, and he had a five-gallon bucket of this stuff. And a rat came over, landed in it, started swimming around, realized he couldn't get out, and just sank to the bottom and started breathing. What? And he said, oh, I'm on to something here. (laughs) So they then wanted to figure out how they could give this as an artificial blood. I see. Well, what it did was it carried oxygen exceptionally well, but it didn't pick up the dioxide. So in essence, you would die of your own gases. There's another one that we've used and that I have done research on that is um, made of cow's blood. Mm-hmm. I've heard about this a little bit. Yeah. Yes. And okay. so that's called Hemopure mm-hmm. as far as a brand name is concerned. I know we don't want to endorse a product and I'm not doing that, but that's what it's called. And it oxygenates better than blood hmm. in that blood has what's called a 2-3 DPG curve. And when you refrigerate it, the curve shifts to the left. Because the blood substitute doesn't have a 2,3-G, 2P diphosphoglycerate, it just pretty much goes straight across the bottom. So it oxygenates immediately. Right. And, and that's, again, the big goal. Because I know we're <clears> getting <throat> out of three minutes. So the big goal about blood is getting oxygen to every single yeah. point in our body that right. we need. I mean, that's and why that's we need the blood. Thing. On that note, yes, Dr. Tyrock, did you want to add something? I guess say two things. Yes. Because he made me think of that. As he was talking about the transplant thing with the nurses, so that made me remember, in the 1960s when they started doing kidney transplants, Mm -hmm. all these people that received a kidney, they would transfuse them because blood immunocompromises the patient. And that's why they were doing that as transplant because they did not have all the immunosuppressive agents we have now. So blood transfusion is an immunosuppressant to the patient. Mm-hmm. They're at high risk of infections, pneumonia, et cetera. So we don't want to just give blood to everybody unless we need to. So. Right. But what I want to say, my closing thing is, for my part, is the blood shortage is real. 
Right. Okay. It was uh-huh. sort of a problem before COVID. It's definitely a problem now because not as many blood drives as there were getting better now. Uh-huh. Not as many people want to donate. Not as many donors in the past. It's not so good in El Paso, but, I can tell you, but other parts of the country you can read, they are stopping elective surgeries in some places. Because there's not enough blood. Not enough blood. I just this week I was reading in San Antonio, they had one day supply last week of blood for that city, that big region of San Antonio that gets covered. They're typically three to five days. Mm -hmm. They were down to one day. And so they were begging donors, just like we're talking tonight. Right. So that's what they were doing in San Antonio. Right. That, that's my thing I want to get across. It's, no, it's that's, a real, that's perfect. It's a real shortage. Yeah, there is a real yeah. shortage. And J- James, you get to close a show with that idea. You know, again, <laughs> we got to, you no know, serve them a beer when it's all said, Jeff. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe you can put somebody out there. But again, this is where that plea comes in. I mean, if there's ever a time to do something good for your fellow human being, um, this would be it. I mean, people talk about organ donations. They talk about, you know, taking, giving people money on the street corner. But th- this is your plea. If there's something else you want to say, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, I think it, to look at, to kind of understand where it's going, because if you listen uh, to the radio or to ads, national ads that are out there, you're hearing, you're probably hearing uh, more about critical blood shortages mm-hmm. uh, more often than what we used to. Prior to COVID, as Dr. Tyrick said, there was some there was some challenges with with the blood supply then. But if you go back even ten years and and, and beyond that, there's been a steady decline. Over the last ten years, there's been almost a thirty eight percent decline in um, blood donor engagement. And that's not just that's not by talent. That's mm-hmm. blood centers All across around. the country. Yeah. And so, if if that trend continues, there's clearly a little bit bigger health crisis. That's looming. I don't want to be gloom and doom about about all of these kind of things. COVID certainly has excel, accelerated that yeah, pace. Right. Mm-hmm. You and and from, a, from right. a donor from a donor based perspective, we're looking for the same thing that every civic club out there is looking for: adequacy for today and mm-hmm. sustainability for tomorrow. So we are needing to engage those uh, 17, 18, 19 year old donors, 20 to 45 year old donors right. that we lose from 20 to 45, and then they start donating again at 60 when they retire. They have a little bit of time, mm-hmm. but in between. Between there is where it's very difficult to get donors um, to engage, and that's that's my job, and that's my role, that's my passion is to go out and get those folks to take make blood donation a part of their life, commit right. to doing it, and then and then take that passion forward and advocate for blood donation. And that's hopefully what will come out of today. And th- those young people who don't telephone call, there's a uh, vitalent.org that they can always go to. Uh, check out what you guys are doing. You can always sign up to go and or just show up, um, which is kind of nice. But if you have not been able to see this entire program, you can go back and see it on PBS El Paso. You will find the El Paso position. Just go to watch. Also, the El Paso County Medical Society has this program on there. YouTube, you can always find this. And I say that because sometimes people catch or tune in halfway through and they're like, oh, I missed the first half. So that's always nice to do. So by talent, thank you so much for being here, James Bradford and Dr. Tyrock. Mm -hmm. Um, Thanks for joining us and give some blood. You've been watching The El Paso Physician. I'm Catherine Berg. 